गुड आफ्टरनून श्री नरेंद्रन चंद्रजीत बनर्जी माय ओल्ड फ्रेंड फ्रॉम तमिलनाडु डेज यू मेड ए मेंशन अबाउट 1990 वन तमिलनाडु सो ही वाज इन सीआईआई चेन्नई दैट टाइम मिस्टर मुंजल संजीव बजाज लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन एंड मेंबर्स ऑफ द नेशनल काउंसिल ऑफ सीआईआई members who are present here and i can see some of them participating uh, through the virtual mode and they can be seen on the screen now i am actually delighted to be here this afternoon because perhaps this is the first uh, uh, public interaction we are doing i am doing in the physical mode after the pandemic i don't know whether it is right to say after the pandemic but hopefully i am right and we will not see a recurrence of uh, the kind of recurrences we have seen over the last 2 uh, years in fact it is exactly 2 years today that we complete the first uh, you know the uh, experimental or the trial lockdown a single day lockdown which was observed uh, on march uh, 22nd 2020 it was a sunday and i was just checking the calendar on the way and uh, i found that uh, and i find that uh, i mean today we are exactly 2 years 21st march and uh, in last two years the world has uh, gone through a massive amount of transformation and thanks to the developments which are now happening around ukraine i think the entire world is experiencing a great degree of uh, transformation covid followed by the geopolitical crisis which has now come up around uh, ukraine technology has changed during this entire period when the lockdown was introduced i think there was a lot of apprehension how businesses how government offices and how various functions will go on in the economy but thanks to technology i think everything moved and within a matter of weeks the businesses got adjusted to it covid protocols were developed in our lives in businesses in any place which involved a congregation of uh, more people even the marketing the retail marketing also underwent uh, substantial uh, change business methods business models have changed covid has produced a substantial impact on lives livelihood economies and uh, geopolitics and uh, economies and geopolitics life and livelihood have also been impacted by the crisis now around uh, ukraine now what i propose to do today is that uh, i wish to speak for about 15 minutes or so and i would like to just touch upon the rbi's approach during this entire period and then come to the current situation and uh, the way forward the outlook of course as far as monetary policy is concerned or issues which Uh, which uh, you know which are part of the monetary policy i will not uh, be able to speak much because you know i don't want to preempt uh, the monetary policy's decision and also between now and 8th of uh, april you know it's still a long way i think in the remaining today we are on 20 so in the remaining 17 18 days i think many things can change and uh, today it is very difficult for me to it is not appropriate for me to say something on monetary policy and then find that the situation changing and in it, it would be appropriate i leave it for the mpc so i will not touch upon those issues so broadly therefore i will first touch upon the covid response of the reserve bank now our first effort when the you know the lockdown was introduced in fact uh, by the first week of march of 2020 if you recall uh uh if you recall some cases of covid in india had been reported in kerala to begin with and a few other states and by about middle of march it became evident that we will not be immune to this uh, new virus so in rbi the first thing that we did around middle of march around 17th 18th of march the first thing we did is that uh, you know we were very conscious that the financial markets the money markets and all the markets which are in the regulatory jurisdiction of rbi they should function normally so we immediately decided to set up a quarantine facility outside mumbai in kargar in our data center we sanitized the whole place and about 200 of our employees rbi officers staff and service providers which ultimately went up went up to about 250 they were put in quarantine 
and uh, that time the testing protocol etc had not developed but we did a general checkup and they were put under quarantine and within just matter of three to four days we were able to put up that quarantine facility we had hired a hotel entire hotel had been hired where all these 250 people were put so that was mainly to ensure that the markets that is the money markets the gsec markets the forex markets they function normally because it was it's quite possible that in the main, you uh, know, in, in our office, in the central office, people may get affected. So that was the first thing we did. And then going into policy around that time, also around 22nd, 23rd, we decided to advance the monetary policy committee meeting. And uh, we also uh, decided, uh, you know, around that time, we did decide that, uh, uh, you know, the central office building also, we decided to close down and sanitize it. And we activated our... Uh, you know, uh, uh, guest house, which we have in Napier C Road, not far from here, which became a kind of a parallel office only for the governor, deputy governors, and a very few senior officers. So that became a parallel office from where we functioned almost for uh, two months because we didn't want too many people to come to the office and uh, risk uh, themselves and cause risks to others. So, and on a need basis, other people were called or we talked to them on, uh, you know, on the VC mode. And the first, uh, you know, so therefore the first emphasis was to see that the, uh, the uh, you know, the financial markets and the financial sector, they functioned normally. Infrastructure side, we had ensured that the markets, you know, all our uh, the markets, they run normally through the quarantine facility. So therefore we advanced the monetary policy committee meeting and parallelly we worked out other measures. And our approach, our focus was to reduce the cost of money. So we cut interest rates by the repo rate by 75 basis points. We had, we were also, we had to see that the financial markets, which it appeared were freezing up. There was no activity in the financial markets happening. And within a matter of a week or 10 days, the financial markets appeared to be freezing up. So we decided that liquidity should not be scarce. There should be abundant liquidity. So we announced liquidity infusion measures, you know, through this uh, long-term repo operations, the targeted repo operations through which we injected huge amount of liquidity. And subsequently, as we went ahead, we announced other regulatory and uh, other kind of uh, dispensations and reliefs. But one interesting thing, which we did go learning from past experience that almost every announcement that was made, whether accepting perhaps the rate of interest to reduction, interest rate reduction, accepting that any liquidity infusion or any regulatory relief which had been given in terms of moratorium or in terms of restructuring of loans, everything had a sunset date. So all these reliefs, liquidity and other support system to the economy, they had a starting date, they had an end date. Because we didn't want to leave them open-ended and repeat the, you know, the bitter experience and the which we have gone through over the past. So that, you know, so that whatever liquidity goes in, it comes out on a particular date. For example, the uh, cash reserve ratio for the banks, which is uh, normally at uh, 4%, it was reduced to 3% exactly for one year. And it ended at the end of one year, excepting we gave some two weeks uh, extension towards the end, but it ended. The liquidity we injected, most of it had a sunset date that we are giving it for one year, so we are giving it for three years, and a lot of it has in fact uh, uh, come back. If I can uh, tell the figures, we announced a total liquidity support of about uh, 17 lakh crores, you know, over the last uh, two years or so. Out of 17 lakh crores, what the banks, the small finance banks and others, they availed was about, uh, was about uh, 12 lakh crores. Out of 12 lakh crores, as I speak to you today, 5 lakh crores have already come back. And rest of it will mature at the end of the third year. And some of it also will come back in the intervening period. But having done that, I would like to make it very clear with a lot of emphasis that even going forward, we will ensure that there is abundant liquidity in the market for the credit system to be active for the credit system to function normally 
and we will ensure that there is no scarcity of uh, liquidity there will be abundant liquidity to meet the productive requirements of the economy so that is a clear statement which i wish to make while we are pulling out liquidity you see when you inject liquidity you are entering into what various people from time to time describe as a chakra view everybody knows how to a lot of people know how to enter but very few people few people know how to come out so it is therefore necessary that you have sunset dates and so far as rbi is concerned the day we announced that we entered into that chakra view we planned for the exit route also and we will come out smoothly and our effort has been to ensure that the whole process is uh, takes place both injection as well as withdrawal in a very non disruptive manner and throughout this entire period we have used uh, communication as a tool of uh, monetary policy the idea was to give market confidence the idea was to give forward guidance to the market to market players what comes next because there was so much of uncertainty and apprehension a lot of forward guidance had to be given so therefore from time to time you know the monetary policy statements which i make on behalf of the reserve bank and the monetary policy every two months that became an instrument of communication monetary policy statements were earlier just about 10 minutes or so now the monetary policy statements are about half an hour or so because we give lot of forward guidance to the markets and uh, so communication became a major instrument in this our focus was also on the banking sector in fact uh, throughout this period we had to deal with the failure of a large uh, systemic uh, uh, you know large uh, you know not systemic but a large uh, scheduled commercial bank the yes bank uh, you know the crisis came up in fact we were uh, fortunate that we were able to take the measure in a very innovative way we dealt with that problem and uh, just before the pandemic set in in fact the new board of directors of the yes bank had been put in place then during this period we had challenges from again another small uh, private sector bank and the merger with uh, dbs uh, bank that took place then we have so many other cases of uh, few other cases of nbfcs and banks so all of these cases the rbi rose up to the occasion in each and every case we came out with innovative and new kind of solutions so it was not so we were our approach in the entire period has been going beyond or looking beyond the rule book it's not as if something is a problem is there and a rule is there and the rule says that if this happens do this now that's not enough when you are dealing with a pandemic related uncertainty that is not enough when we are now looking at the new crisis which is you know which we are now confronted with because of the war in uh, ukraine so therefore rbi has gone much beyond the rule book we have tried to be as innovative as possible and i must compliment my colleagues in the reserve bank who are risking their lives through their entire two year period who have been constantly regulatory regularly coming to office and working uh, working with me and all of us have been working as a team so the financial sector you know we had the problem of nbfc also there were large nbfc failures referring them under the ibc so therefore uh, and also not that we have also during this period come out with new regulations in the banking sector we came out with a new governance document which is now implemented for the nbfcs we have come out with a new scale based regulation for microfinance institutions two days last week we came out with a new regulatory framework and now for arcs and for other uh, you know for uh, urban cooperative banks also new regulatory guidelines are in the pipeline and they will be announced in the next uh, one or two months and so as a result and also throughout this entire period in fact i recall i think 2020 when i uh, interacted with the cii uh, i had mentioned it also at that time i had referred to it our effort to impress upon the banks to mobilize additional capital and throughout 2020 and 2021 we have been emphasizing on this point and i am happy to report that uh, almost all banks both public and private sector banks have raised additional capital and today as i am speaking to you the capital adequacy of banks is well above the regulatory requirements it's about on an you know at the system level it's at 16% the 
gross non performing assets of all banks put together at an all are at an all time low of 6.5% so that has been possible because of the kind of you know the kind of uh, approach which we have taken of course the banks have also risen you know they have risen to the occasion they have also responded very proactively so that i think and also the provision coverage ratio that is the provision the banks make for their bad assets that also today stands at about 69% which is a very robust uh, figure now all this has resulted that uh, the process of recovery is now on and the rbi for last two years has remained supportive of uh, the uh, supportive of uh, the growth and uh, we have uh, resisted all temptations and all expectations and all if i should say uh, you know uh, all expectations and temptations let me leave it at that of uh, sort of uh, uh, reversing our monetary policy and uh, moving away from accommodative stance moving away from support to growth into a kind of a tightening regime so we have resisted that and there is a reason for that because if you recall in 2020 on for a couple of months in uh, uh, 2020 i think it happened in september and october 2021 it happened in may and june when the inflation crossed six per seven percent in 2020 for two months and again in uh, last year in may and june it exceeded six percent there was a lot of expectation and there was a lot of sort of you know a lot of analytical pressure on us through newspaper articles magazines articles that rbi should do this that but we resisted that temptation because we could clearly foresee that the inflation will moderate and it did moderate because you see the point is uh, if you start uh, compressing i mean if you st start initiating a pre premature demand compression through monetary policy action then it would be counterproductive monetary policy addresses the demand side issues supply side issues which is you know in inflation there is a demand side issue there is a supply side issue if there is excessive demand that leads to inflation if there are supply chain problems or supply side problems as we have now that is for somebody else to deal with that is for the government to deal with but demand side is what monetary policies world over do either they sort of tighten the interest rates squeeze liquidity and try to compress the demand so a premature monetary policy intervention would have resulted in demand compression and that would have been counterproductive for growth and revival and when the economy was facing the prospect of a grim prospect of a negative growth in 2020-21 that was not the time to you know sort of think of changing your stance the rbi continues to remain supportive of growth what we will do in the next monetary policy is something which we will discuss our minds are kept open i uh, would exp i think some media friends are available so i would uh, make very clear that please don't start your interpretations don't take anything as a signal don't take anything as a signal that the rbi is thinking in terms of this or the rbi is thinking in terms of this because i am not giving any signal or any indication so therefore i don't want to see a headline tomorrow that rbi is thinking of this or thinking of that just leave that let the mpc meet and the mpc will decide but having said that i would like to say that we are conscious of our primary responsibility of maintaining price stability of maintaining inflation and uh, the inflation numbers i mean a lot of developments are taking place for example the crude prices touched 130 dollars they came down to 99 dollars today they are you know 112 dollars so we really don't know how it is going to pan out new supply chains are developing and during this entire period so what has happened is that everybody i mean you said that in the your in your opinion poll among the ceos uh, everybody expects the global global growth to slow down everybody expects uh, inflation to rise up so there are also challenges coming with regard to supply side issues of uh, uh, shipping charges non availability of containers container charges and other kind of supply bottlenecks but i think 
overall what is happening is that uh, the trend towards globalization today is being challenged there are disruptions taking in the realm of globalization but i am quite confident that the world will recalibrate and readjust to these challenges and uh, come out of this uh, problem as it has done in the past at another level we can expect some positive developments also out of uh, i mean it's not the right word to say positive development because uh, there is loss i mean there is uh, suffering there is loss of life due to war but certain trends can be sort of expected and at another level we can expect a faster transition to renewables and green energy because of this new sanctions and uh, pressures on energy supply particularly uh, supply of uh, you know crude and gas from russia to other european countries i would expect a faster transition to green energy and uh, renewables happening in uh, uh, in in fact in all countries because it creates so much of uncertainty with regard to availability of gas and crude it also it is also possible secondly that there will be revival of investment on fossil fuels advanced countries which are you know which have been talking about climate change and which had not been investing at all or maybe investing very marginally in fossil fuel will now be forced to invest in fossil fuel and ramp up their production capacities and actual uh, production but at the same time defense expenditure is likely to be high especially is likely to be higher than in the past especially in the european countries and that would put pressure on their budgets that would put pressure on their fiscal and uh, will it be at the cost of welfare expenditure in those countries that is something to be seen now so far as india is concerned these are not really you know major issues for us these are major issues for the european countries which i said but india we have our own uh, transition path towards uh, renewables and towards uh, you know uh, climate uh, towards green energy and that of course india is well poised to achieve them now looking at the current situation and looking at india's prospects i think overall the indian economy is far better placed and i am saying it for two reasons number one the high frequency indicators and in rbi we monitor more than 60 high frequency indicators almost on a day to day basis and that includes uh, production of uh, you know let's say two wheelers uh, car passenger cars uh, commercial vehicles tractors it includes things like gst collections e-way bills issued it also includes uh, air freight railway freight air passengers you know port activity so there are about more than 60 high frequency indicators which we monitor and today when i was morning looking at it uh, the you know the high frequency indicators and we look them in terms of red uh, orange and uh, green red i did not see anywhere in the last column which is the latest data we have excepting i did not see red but i saw orange in uh, Uh, for example in tractors in uh, two wheelers in three wheelers and maybe one or two but when it came to gst or e way bills or it came to you know several other important activities uh, you know i find that they were in green that means things are looking up but again these are numbers and given the kind of uncertainty which we have so we have to see how it pans out but so far as india is concerned even now the high frequency indicators of economic activity broadly look uh, you know they are in the green zone the other thing which is very important if you compare ourselves with uh, the 2019 taper 2013 taper when we unlike the 20 2013 taper tantrum unlike 2013 today we have in the run up to the current crisis crisis meaning because of the war in ukraine in the run up to the current crisis our current account deficit is very very low and secondly our forex reserves are very high over the last 3 years our forex reserves have gone up by almost uh, 270 billion dollars or so in january 2000 uh, 
19, it was about uh, just little below $400 billion. Today, as we are talking here, we have foreign exchange reserves. The latest data is 622 uh, billion US dollars. That is already a published figure. Other than that, we hold a lot of Forex in our forward assets, which will mature from time to time every month. And today we are holding about 50 to 55. In fact, to be precise, 55 billion US dollars, we are holding it in the forward market and they will all come back to us in the coming months. So 622 plus 55, our reserves are 677 billion US dollars. India is comfortably placed to deal, deal with any effect of spillover or any challenge with regard to financing of current account deficit is concerned. So economy is better placed today. On the external sector also, we are better placed, but we are living in an uncertain world. There is no reason for complacency. We have to be watchful and we are monitoring this uh, very closely. We are also monitoring the crude and commodity prices, the volatility. Very closely, we are watching them. Worries have been expressed in certain quarters and in several quarters about, uh, you know, the inflation uh, going up in India. As I pointed out earlier, similar situations prevailed in 2020. It also prevailed in 2021. Today, again, the inflation for the last two months has been 6%. Whether it is the situation is similar, only time will tell. Our earlier estimate, which we had given about the inflation scenario, we were looking at inflation, CPI inflation to be 4.5% by March, March of 23. Now we have to watch. It's, I will not like to comment what is our expectation on inflation and growth, because that is something which I would like to leave for the monetary policy. But having said that, I would like to very emphatically say that while we are watchful and monitoring all the trends, international, global trends, regional, domestic trends, with regard to economic activity, with regard to inflation, with regard to growth, we are watchful. But at the same time, I can say that uh, we remain, we stand committed and we are confident of dealing with any emerging situation and dealing with any emerging challenge. That kind of commitment and confidence is there in the Reserve Bank. As we have done in the past, we are confident that we will be able to do it in the future also. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Das, for a very positive and reassuring uh, speech. A uh, few points before I open it up uh, for the Q&A. Firstly, the support of 17 lakh crore that you talked about was timely and done in the most pragmatic manner. Thank you for that. Uh, we also heartened by your assurance on sufficient liquidity. I think that's always a concern of industry. So it's good to hear that. Uh, we also see that RBI is buying the rupee and selling dollars and that's also something which is sometimes comforting for the industry. And your assurance on forward guidance is also very important. And you talked about the chakra view. I think India has been a good example of how it has got in and got out of uh, the situation. Uh, so thank you very much for that. I'm going to open it up for Q&A. So we'll probably do three questions at a time so that you can respond and then address the others. So first from Uday. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. I must say that uh, the RBI's role in the last two years to ensure systemic stability and protect the country has been phenomenal. And I can say as a practitioner, uh, it has truly, in many ways, saved India and helped it navigate to the last, through, to, through the last two years. I'm going to go back to February 10 statement of yours, sir. And this was on the backdrop of the demise of Lata Mangeshkar. And I will quote from your statement. Quote, as the great Lata Mangeshkar, whom we lost recently sang in her immortal song aaj fir jine ki tamanna hai together with the spirit behind the second behind the next line of this beautiful song she has conveyed an eternal message of optimism closed for the benefit of the audience the second line of lata mangeshkar's song was aaj fir marne ka irada hai 
सो द टू लाइन्स वेंट आज फिर जीने की तमन्ना है आज फिर मरने का इरादा है मे बी इट वॉज प्रेसेंट इन टर्म्स ऑफ द रशिया यूक्रेन क्राइसिस वेरी सून आफ्टर दैट वंडरफुल कोट विच यू मेड सर सो एट दिस स्टेज बोथ दोज आर बोथ द लाइन्स आर वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग लाइन्स फ्रॉम द पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू ऑफ ऑल द रिस्क टेकर्स यूर as well as from the point of view of policy makers who take the risk which of the two lines would you think we should be thinking about as this point of time aaj fir jine ki tamanna hai aaj fir marne ka irada hai thank you take two more questions rishad thank you thank you governor das for those thoughtful comments you know in the context of what's happened in the last few weeks you talked about the ukraine crisis the extreme volatility of oil fed tapering which has begun the commitment to increase i'm here fed rates over the next six you know six to eight times over the next uh, over the next year in this context what do you foresee in terms of the challenges for currency more generally and the rupee in particular thanks to shah nadir thank you very much for keeping the indian economy on a stable level and i entirely agree with you that supply side inflation cannot be cured by demand side problems and as you rightly said that this uh, commodity and food inflation gives us an opportunity both to promote green energy as well as indian agriculture we are importing a lot of vegetable oil and some other commodities and it's a great opportunity to grow more in our country so my question to you is will there be any special schemes for favorable interest rates to green energy or for agriculture thank you do you like to respond or should yeah. i yeah. you see the last question i will uh, sort of uh, reply first now we don't have uh, you know if any interest uh, subvention or any interest subsidy has to be given uh the government gives it from time to time you know the government has various schemes for example in the agriculture sector for the crop loans there is an interest subsidy and the loan is available uh you know at about 4% in fact some states also give a further subsidy on that and the rates of interest are low you know even lower than 4% now so far as rbi is regulatory uh, regulatory framework is concerned the we don't give sectoral uh, you know we don't set sectoral interest rates interest rates are completely deregulated it is left to the lender whether it is a bank or nbfc or any other entity which is in the lending business is for them to determine the rate of interest depending on their cost of funds and uh, their other overhead charges and their uh, uh, risk assessment of individual borrower or borrowers belonging to a particular sector so therefore so far as rbi is concerned that is the position we will not uh, you know the rbi will because it's not a part of our policy it's a it relies in the realm of the fiscal policy and uh, also by and large a general point which i would like to mention is that anything which is built on uh, you know too many support measures too many sops i think right from the beginning that particular business or that particular activity develops certain inherent uh, uh, weaknesses so in the long term it may not be really good for a business to start by leaning on somebody you need some initial support especially the small units i agree but i think leaning on some external support like interest rate subvention etc it uh, sort of injects or it uh, you know it uh, sort of you are also putting in seeds of inherent weakness in that business now with regard to the challenges in currency now as i mentioned our forex reserve figures i mentioned uh, the spillovers arising out of the us uh, fed uh, rate hike or what the other advanced economies will do you see it is varying from uh, you know it is uh, uh, sort of uh, it remains quite uh, mixed ecb has started what they call their you know their uh, uh they are reducing their asset purchase us is also reducing its asset purchase but so far as india is concerned we stopped our asset purchase in october last year 
that is the government security acquisition program the gsap which we announced that again started in april ended in october so therefore we are really in that way in that sense we are ahead of them this is a you know little realized fact people think that you know we are falling behind the curve no we started asset purchase at a particular date we ended it on a particular date with regard to interest rates if you see the language is different from country to it is varying from country to country two of the largest economies in the world they are pulling in different directions so far as monetary policy is concerned one is on a tightening mode the other one is on a loosening mode pboc did not raise their bank rates uh, yesterday us has announced the rate hike so there can be some spillovers but whatever are the spillovers we will i can say with reasonable amount of confidence that we will be able to maintain the stability of the indian rupee in fact our interventions in the foreign exchange market if you see it is uh, the standard policy our standard policy is that we intervene to prevent excessive volatility and the current financial year till last thursday today i mean i didn't have time to take out the number today but till last thursday indian rupee depreciation vis a vis the dollar in this financial year from 1st april last year till uh, last uh, thursday was 17th of uh, uh, march it was minus 0.4% less than 1% less than you know 0.4% the depreciation was not minus depreciation was 0.4% so we have been able to maintain the stability of the indian rupee going forward i think our forex reserves and our ability to finance the current account deficit again inflow of fdi is also expected i think that was a, there was a mention mention of, there was a mention made about it so with that we will be able to uh, it it will be our endeavor and we should be able to maintain the stability of the indian rupee now coming to uh, uday's point about uh, uh, both the you know the two lines i think both the two you know both the lines mean the same thing one is explicit the other one is implicit the first line jine ki tamanna is is very explicit the second line marne ka irada hai is because she is so happy that she doesn't care if she dies so there you know the optimism is implicit <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh, mr kk misri kk yeah uh, i just like to say that uh, rbi has done a phenomenal job and thank you so much for that i talk to so many foreign institutional investors and they are extremely complimentary about the role rbi has played right through this uh, pandemic i just have one suggestion which is with regard to affordable housing now as you know housing is one of the biggest parameters to economic growth because there are so many multiplier uh, impact that housing has whether it's on cement steel paint power all of that so there are so the the amount of money the amount of funding required for affordable housing is actually huge it's massive now one of the avenues of raising foreign for raising money for affordable housing is through the ecb route external commercial borrowing route there we have a few suggestions and i'd be very happy to come over and give you a note on what the suggestions are thank you pavan thanks darren mr das uh, i i'm sure most of the people are going to be praising you for what you and rbi did over these two years which really has kept the economy afloat and some some sectors of the economy have bounced back like you did mention some are still in orange uh, my own industry two wheelers is still struggling not able to come out after the second wave so we do look forward to continued support for those sectors to also bounce back a quick question there is there is a risk for the global economies to go into stagflation and india being now an aligned economy with most global economies could also get there if that was to happen what what would you and the rbi do and what would your recommendations be for the 
for the membership of CII here. Thanks, Pawan. Sachit? Uh, sir, my, my congratulations also on wonderful stewardship in these tough times. Sir, a question looking forward. Do you think a time has come that uh, to look back that when we set change from WPI to CPI and set a target of 4% with a variation of band of 2%, which means sometimes 2%, which can be extremely low inflation, maybe for a developed country, yes. Would there be a case in the future to revise this target of 4% maybe give more leeway, maybe five, six or whatever with that band. So, because even in very low inflation, the increments in the, in the corporate sector you will check are eight to 9%. And when the inflation is high, it goes up to 11, 12%. So really the real costs on wages are increasing even when inflation is very low. Thank you, sir. Is with regard to affordable housing, I would request Mr. Keki Mistri to please send me a note and uh, I will go through it. Sure, I will sir. ask my colleagues also to have a look at it. And if required, we will have a discussion also with you and we will uh, see what can be done about that. Thank you, sir. So thank you for your, uh, I mean, uh, inputs, which you have uh, said that you will provide. I will wait for your uh, note. Uh, with regard to the prospect of a stack, stackflation, whether it is a risk for India. Now, I... In our assessment, I think such prospects don't exist because uh, I think India is far away from such a grim uh, prospect. So far as European economies are concerned, whether it is the most advanced economy or the European economies, you have to take into account what is their inflation target and where their inflation is. United States, for example, their target is 2%. And today they are almost touching 8%. 7.9 was the last uh, figure which was released. That was the last uh, print. Similarly, in Europe and other countries, uh, you see that the inflation is uh, way above their target, which is mostly 2%. So far as India is concerned, as was mentioned, our target is 4 plus minus 2. So up to 6%, 6 we are still within the range. For last two months, it was 6%. We do expect the inflation to moderate going forward. But on inflation, as I said, we will spell out our inflation roadmap. I mean, what is our estimation? What is our expectation uh, in the monetary policy? So I don't uh, see a situation of India, uh, you know, where the inflation keeps on uh, exceeding the, the band which we have, 2 to 6%. So therefore, uh, that is not, uh, you know, that is, I think, a very, very remote possibility for India. And Indian growth also, this year's projection is 8.9% uh, uh, for the current year. And uh, no, sorry, that's for the, yeah, that's for the current year, 8.9%. And even if you factor in the impact of uh, you know, impact of uh, uh, the Ukraine crisis, etc. It will be very marginal on that. Again, the numbers I am not commenting whether 8.9 will become so much or it will not become so much. It will be eight, still remain at 8.9 percent. That is something which we, I would leave for the next uh, monetary policy. And in any case, our uh, uh, you know internal exercises and analysis is still going on, and uh, I can't really say any number today not just because of MPC confidentiality issues, but because those numbers are stray still on the drawing board. So India, I don't see the inflation and uh, inflation going up beyond uh, 6%. And uh, in, in fact, uh, our expectation that uh, was that it will moderate to 4.5%. Now, when we rework, we will know exactly where we stand whether it will be higher than 4.5% or it can still be 4.5%. 4, 4 and also, let us remember that uh, when you are talking of, when you are making assumptions on crude and commodity prices to calculate the inflation, you assume a figure and you assume that it will prevail for 365 days. Now, we don't know today whether crude oil will remain at $100 plus till the end of March 23. I mean, it can come down, it can also go up. So the situation today is unimaginably uncertain. In fact, the OECD in its latest report yesterday, in their analysis, they have 
not given any number with regard to inflation or growth because they say that it is very very uncertain and uh, it will be difficult to give any number if you remember in the beginning of the pandemic also we had stopped giving any growth projection because the situation was so volatile but with all the volatility with all the uncertainties india as far as i can see and as far as i understand the problem and as far as we see it in the reserve bank the prospect of a stagflation so far as india is concerned does not arise i can be i think i am uh, i can be as clear as that now with regard to wpi and cpi you know the rbi had uh, appointed a committee in 2014 which worked on this uh, inflation targeting and it was that time seen that uh, you know sometimes due to sometimes you know it is very difficult to reach a particular number for example if you say my target as in advanced countries is 2% now it can be little above or little more and then there are situations of uh, stress acute stress and extraordinary unforeseen situations which come up in fact it is our target band you know it is the flexible inflation targeting with the flexible band between 2 to 6% that is what enabled the reserve bank to provide all the monetary policy accommodation and the reliefs that we have that we have provided over the last 2 years instead if it was just a 4% we would not have the flexibility to do many most of the things as we have done so a flexible inflation targeting where whereby you don't have a particular target of 4 but your failure is if it falls below 2% or if it is higher than 6% that flexibility and also flexibility to the extent that it is not 4% in a single month it has to be 4% over a period of time for three consecutive quarters if we are you know falling outside this target band then only it is considered as a failure of a monetary policy now the committee which had gone into it had seen according to their analysis uh any inflation above 6% will be negative for growth so that is why the upper band is kept at 6% and 4% was considered as an optimum number at which there is an optimal balance between inflation and growth so that is why 4% is a very well considered number in fact in our currency and finance report which we published in january or march last year i think we published it in the month of march probably the currency and finance report which used to be published earlier but had been stopped we revived that it's available in the rbi website a detailed uh, it's a detailed documentation and detailed analysis has been presented about the rational of this 4% plus minus 2% thank you we are now on borrowed time so i would request the questioners to be brief uh, uh, we were supposed to finish at 5:30 mr das has agreed to stay on for some more time uh, vinayak uh, mr governor today the national bank for financing infrastructure and development the new dfi nabfit is probably emerged as one of the most significant measures that the government has announced in recent times for financing long term projects in infrastructure and i would also join the chorus of thank yous for the speed with which the institution was created with a wavelength match between rbi and the ministry of finance to structure this institution the question is as as far as we understand the leveraging capacity of this institution is the same as current banking norms which broadly means that it can leverage nine times now with a equity capital of 20000 crores which the government has transferred and another 5000 crores which is due any time 25000 crores of equity with a nine leverage would allow this institution to raise 2.25 lakh crores that is grossly inadequate for two reasons one the expectation is that this institution would be in the short term able to provide five to short term i mean in the next two to five years 5 to 6 to 7 lakh crores for the infrastructure sector and secondly developmental financial institutions all over the world and the chinese development bank is a key example at the peak infrastructure build of china had leveraged itself above 60 times its equity now the question for you is are you going to restrict this institution to nine times leveraging which means it can only do 2.25 lakh crores 
and stifle economic growth? Or will you allow it being a 100% sovereign backed institution to actually go at much higher levels of 10, 15, 20? That's the question. Thanks, Vinayak. Janne? Uh, Governor, I'm very happy that Vinayak asked that question. The question that I have for you is that looking at what's happened with the Russian reserves, how comfortable are we with our foreign exchange reserves? What, what comfort do they actually provide in the face of any type of sanctions, given the dollar back nature of the, of the global financial system? And what could we do to alleviate some of these risks? Keep it free and listen. Thanks, uh, Jayant. Uh, there are few sectors of economy which obviously uh, bring in very differentiated kind of uh, uh, returns. Uh, you said very clearly that uh, the current war, all small countries essentially will feel threatened and will want more and more investment to go into security. When we start looking at security, uh, last five years back, there was nothing like defense export. It started building up built up to about one and a half billion dollar. And last two years, thanks to the COVID, it's fallen by about 40%. When we start looking at the world, we see only China and India really wanting to go big way in terms of some of the small countries export. My belief is our rate of interest, specifically for these kind of sectors, which have huge diplomacy benefits on the defense front, there's a room for actually doing better financing them for the working capital. Of course, today, there's no mechanism to do that. One possible mechanism we had all thought was to actually take out 1% of the reserves that we talked of. We are at extremely good position on that. Purely for dollar inflow, lend money at international rates. We then can take on Chinese, we then can do some good amount of exports. Now, so far as the NAFID, that is the National Bank for uh, uh, you know, financing infrastructure development. So far as NAFID is concerned, it's the beginning, 20,000 crore is the beginning. And uh, I don't think uh, that's the end of it. So going forward, depending on utilization, I think uh, the government, uh, you know, it's open to the government. I can't speak on behalf of the government, but uh, it's open to the government to step up that, uh, uh, you know, beyond 20,000 uh, crores. So that option is always available to government. With regard to leverage nine times, you see, the risks also have to be factored in. Even government, uh, so far as the, uh, you know, so far as the fiscal side is concerned, while there is increase in capital expenditure, last year budget and even this year's budget, and where, where, while there is a fiscal expansion, but the government is also equally mindful about uh, the debt to GDP, the overall debt burden, because otherwise the interest cost, the interest charges, the outflow from the budget for interest payment itself will become so much that your current expenditure will suffer. So every authority, whether it is a fiscal authority, the government or the central bank, we have to also, while focusing on growth, while focusing on development, we have to also look at stability and long-term sustainability of all investments. So today we want high infrastructure development, but what consequences it has on the stability of the economy? After all, we have to, as a central bank, we have to look what will be the position three years down the road or 10 years down the road. So we have to factor in stability issues and we have to also look at sustainability of uh, every investment. So uh, sometimes a uh, rush for higher investment, throwing the stability aspects or you know completely ignoring the stability aspects and sustainability aspects would be not sometimes it would be generally be counterproductive so we have taken a very considered call and uh, in any case uh, it's uh, you said a figure of 2.25 lakh crore as i mentioned it is uh, i mean it's not uh, the end of it's the first lot so going forward it's open to the government 
uh, to sort of do more in this area. And I'm sure if the time requires, if the situation warrants, they will do it. With regard to sanctions versus uh, reserves, you see, our reserves are quite uh, well dispersed. And uh, I don't foresee a situation whereby India will ever face a sanction situation. We are a democratic country, rule of law prevails. And uh, India doesn't have any expansionary ambitions. This is something which I think the government uh, has stated. These are not my words. And in any case, I am not in a position to say that. It's for the government to say. I'm just quoting what the Prime Minister said, uh, you know, last year in, uh, in uh, uh, when he visited uh, uh, Ladakh. So I'm just quoting what the Prime Minister of the country said in Ladakh that, you know, we don't believe in expansion. So we don't have that kind of a situation. Our reserves are distributed in various foreign currencies not just concentrated in one currency. We have gold reserves, which are also dispersed partly in India, partly outside. So it is quite diversified. And sanctions, we don't foresee that situation. But yes, it is something which going forward, I think every country will now start uh, thinking about it. But the other issue is that uh, you hold your reserves at wa as what? Are you going to move to a complete gold uh, holding, a complete shift towards gold? The liquidity also has to be seen. But I think why talk of a problem which is not there? And these are issues which uh, I think are best uh, left to the central bank to deal with internally. And I can only say at this point of time that our reserves are quite you know, well distributed. Uh, in many currencies, but yes, the leading currency has the majority of it without doubt. I mean, dollar, most of it is in, lot of it, I would say, is in dollars, but it is also in other currencies. And we have decided to diversify, not now. Some six months ago, we decided to diversify into other currencies also. So I don't see that as a problem. With regard to defense exports, if defense expenditure in other countries go up, traditionally, Europe and all, have not been spending much on defense, but I think if defense uh, budget in those countries goes up, then it is an opportunity definitely for the Indian uh, uh, defense manufacturers to export our products. India has already made a beginning in this direction. And many of the companies are already, they have been exporting for last uh, several years. So it is an opportunity for our export sector. Now about use of foreign reserve, forex reserves uh, now, that that uh, that you know, first thing is let us remember that the reserves is not our money it is against a liability it is against a liability there is a you know the country has certain liabilities also today our foreign exchange is more than 100% of our external uh, you know debt but the situation varies currency revaluation takes place gold revaluation takes place sometimes internationally the you know the other currencies become more uh, you know they appreciate vis-a-vis -vis the rupee the price of gold goes up it comes down and reserves are something which you know which add lot of which render lot of stability and confidence in any economy today i am able to say there with you know, great amount of confidence that we will be able to deal with any spillover effect because of our 677 billion US dollars. So that is, you know, that is the that represents the strength of our economy, that represents the stability of your, you know, of your economy and exchange rate, uh, this thing, uh, your stability of the exchange rate and the sustainability and the strength of uh, your economy. So therefore, touching the reserves for financing various requirements of the economy are uh, not at all advisable. And they are not in the medium term, forget long term, they're not even in the medium term interest of any government, I'm not just saying India, but for any gov, for any government. Some countries have done it, but I think uh, in India, we today, according to RBI's assessment, I think uh, India should not do that. And uh, we are therefore not in favor of it.